Thank you for joining us for our daily briefing in the fight against COVID-19. I'm joined today by Dr Jenny Harris, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and Professor Stephen Paris, the Medical Director of NHS England. I'd like first to update you all on the facts about the spread of COVID-19 and the steps that we are then taking in the battle against this virus. 143,186 people have now been tested for the virus. Of those, 25,150 have tested positive. And sadly, yesterday we recorded the highest single increase in the number of deaths as a result of COVID-19. 381 people died, meaning that of those hospitalised in the UK, the number who have passed away now totals 1,789. Every death is the loss of a loved one, and our thoughts and prayers are with those who are grieving. Overall, 10,767 people in England have been admitted to hospital with COVID-19 symptoms. The largest number of those is in London, with 3,915 people in hospital care, while in the Midlands, the number of those hospitalised is now 1,918 and accelerating upwards. These numbers reinforce the vital importance of following the government's social distancing guidelines. The more we restrict contact, the more we slow the spread of the infection, the more that we can help the NHS build the capacity needed to care for those most in need. And that capacity is increasing. More NHS staff are returning to the front line and more testing is taking place to help those self-isolating come back and to protect those working so hard in our hospitals and in social care. But while the rate of testing is increasing, we must go further, faster. A critical constraint on the ability to rapidly increase testing capacity is the availability of the chemical reagents which are necessary in the testing. The Prime Minister and the Health Secretary are working with companies worldwide to ensure that we get the material we need to increase tests of all kinds. And as well as increasing the number of staff on the front line and the tests which protect them, we must also increase the capacity to provide oxygen to those worst affected by the disease. We have just over 8,000 ventilators deployed in NHS hospitals now. This number has increased since the epidemic began thanks to the hard work of NHS professionals. But we need more. That's why we are buying more ventilators from abroad, including from EU nations. And it's also why we're developing new sources of supply at home. Before the epidemic struck, we had very little domestic manufacture of ventilators. But now, thanks to the dedication of existing medical supply companies and the ingenuity of our manufacturing base, we have existing models being produced in significantly greater numbers and new models coming on stream. Orders have been placed with consortia led by Ford, Airbus, the Formula One racing teams including McLaren, GKN Aerospace and Rolls-Royce and Dysons. And I can announce that this weekend the first of thousands of new ventilator devices will roll off the production line and be delivered to the NHS next week. From there they will be rapidly distributed to the front line. And as well as increasing the capacity for ventilation which helps support those patients worst affected we're also increasing the capacity to provide oxygen to affected patients at an earlier stage in the process of the disease, helping to avert, we hope, the deterioration of their condition. A team led by UCL, working with Mercedes-Benz, will produce 10,000 new CPAP devices to support affected patients, and a team from Oxford University are also developing related technology. And in our determination to prevent as many patients as possible seeing their condition worsen, we are conducting rapid clinical trials on those drugs, including anti-malarials, which may be able to reduce the impact of COVID-19 on those affected. But even as we seek to explore every avenue to slow the spread of the disease, to reduce its impact and to save lives, I'm conscious of the sacrifices that so many are making. That's why the Chancellor's economic package is in place to support people through a difficult time. It's also why we're working so closely with our colleagues in the devolved administrations, 
to coordinate our response across the United Kingdom, and I'm grateful to them, as I am to the thousands of dedicated public sector workers, cleaners and social workers, prison and police officers, those in the Royal Mail and in our schools. And I want to thank them, and also the leaders of the trade unions who represent them. In this united national effort, we're also delivering food and prescription drugs to up to 1.5 million of the most vulnerable who are self-isolating for three months. And we will do more to help, working with the three quarters of a million people who volunteered to help at this time. Many are already heavily involved in local community support schemes. And we want to work with them to, we, to ensure that we support not just the 1.5 million most vulnerable to the disease, but all those who need our help through this crisis. Those without social support, those in tough economic circumstances, those who need the visible hand of friendship at a challenging time. That's why my Cabinet colleague George Eustace and the Food and Farming Minister Victoria Prentice will be leading work with food suppliers, retailers, local authorities and voluntary groups to support our neighbours in need. I also want to thank the men and women of the military who've stepped up their work as part of the ongoing response to coronavirus. Three RAF Puma helicopters are now stationed at Kinloss Barracks in Murray. These Pumas are working closely with the Chinook and a Wildcat helicopter based at RAF Leeming in North Yorkshire to meet requests for assistance from NHS boards and trusts across Scotland and Northern England. A second helicopter facility covers the Midlands and Southern England, working out of the Aviation Task Force headquarters at RAF Benson in Oxfordshire. Chinook and Wildcat helicopters normally based at RAF Odium and RNAS Yeovilton, respectively, support the southern areas. And these helicopter facilities have been set up to support medical transport across Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. The task force is also available for general support, such as moving equipment and personnel to where they are needed across the United Kingdom. And the Kinloss-based support follows the use of an RAF A400M transport aircraft working with the Scottish Ambulance Service to evacuate a critically ill patient from the Shetland Islands to Aberdeen to receive intensive care treatment. I'm deeply grateful for everyone in the armed forces and in the public sector who are doing so much to help us in the fight against coronavirus. And of course, all of us can continue to play our part in supporting them and the health service by staying at home, supporting the NHS and saving lives. Now, I want to ask Stephen to run through the latest data from our Cabinet Office coronavirus fact file. Stephen. Thank you. So our incredible staff in the NHS are working round the clock, pulling out all the stops uh, to prepare for the expected surge in patients with COVID-19. I saw that myself uh, at the NHS Nightingale Hospital uh, in East London this morning and was completely bowled over by the work that is being done there from a standing start a week ago uh, to a new hospital uh, that will be ready to take patients later this week. But as we have repeatedly said and as you have just heard, NHS staff cannot do this on their own. Yes, we can increase capacity, but we also need everybody in the country, every one of you, uh, to help by reducing the transmission of, of the virus because it is by doing that that we will reduce the number of deaths and we will take the pressure uh, off our hospitals and our health system. And the charts uh, that I'm about to show you will show you why that is so important. So all the interventions, all the instructions that the government have given based on the best possible scientific advice and similar to the approach being taken in many countries around the world are designed to reduce social contact. In other words, to reduce the chance that a virus, the virus is passed from one person to another. And by doing that, the spread of the virus reduces uh, and the number of infections reduces. I'm pleased to say that the great British public are paying attention to that message and we see in many ways uh, that that amount of social contact is now reducing. So this first chart shows you an example of that, transport. And as you can see, uh, the number of people using our transplant services has reduced dramatically over the last few weeks. So, for example, you can see in the light blue line 
that uh, transport in London on the tube has decreased dramatically, which demonstrates that people are paying attention and understand the message we are giving. And there are many other examples uh, that show that that contact is being reduced. As the next chart shows, that plays into an impact on the number of infections. So the less social contact, the less the chance is that the virus can move from one person to another. And that will, over time, reduce the number of infections that we are seeing, the number of people testing positive. And you can see here that we have had a rise in the number of new UK cases, but recently there is a little bit of a plateau. Now, I think it's really important not to read too much into this because it's early days, we're not out of the woods, we're very much in the woods, and it's really important that we keep complying with those instructions. But as you can see, uh, the number of infections is not rising as rapidly as it was. So green shoots, but only green shoots, and we must not be complacent and we must not take our foot off the pedal. Now, if infections fall, as the next chart shows, that will also translate uh, into fewer hospital admissions. Hospital admissions typically occur a week or two after an infection. And remember, for the vast majority of people, COVID-19 is a mild flu-like illness, a heavy cold. But for a small percentage of people, hospitalisation is required. Now, you can see here that the rate of hospitalisation has been increasing. Uh, and we would expect that at this stage uh, in the epidemic. But if those infections start to drop, then in the next few weeks, our hope is that the number of hospitalizations will also start to reduce. Now, the good news here is that that line is not going up uh, very steeply, but it is still rising. We're not out of the woods. We need to keep our foot on the pedal. And as you can see there, around a third of the hospital admissions are in London, uh, because as we have said and as we know, uh, the infection is spreading more rapidly in London and London is a bit ahead of the rest of the country in terms of this epidemic. Now, as the next chart shows, um, hospitalisation, um, fortunately, uh, some people who are hospitalised do die. Every death is tragic and we absolutely need to avoid as many deaths as possible by all playing our part. Uh, so what we want to see over time is a reduction in the number of deaths. And you can see here a comparison of deaths in different countries. And you can see maybe in the very light line in the middle that uh, China, over time, has flattened uh, that particular line. In other words, the number of deaths have reduced. And so if we reduce the number of infections, we will reduce the number of hospitalizations, and we will reduce the number of deaths. Maybe some green shoots, but the last thing I would want is a message to anybody that this is a time to take our foot off the pedal, to not comply with the instructions, because this is not a short haul. As we said, this is going to take time, and it's important that we all stick with it, everybody.